Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nicholas DeMoncho. I have been an MIT faculty member for all of eight weeks. I'm taking over as head of the architecture department here a little over two months from now. Um, this moment gives me an opportunity to introduce myself to you, but also to credit everyone who has worked so hard on this, our first virtual lecture of the spring 2020 semester. And one more small piece of the Herculean effort it's taken our students, our staff and our faculty to rapidly and unexpectedly change everything about what we do in order to keep doing what we do. Um, even though we all might be in our homes, um, none of us are in our usual spaces. Uh, current students are struggling with moving their massive commitments online into claustrophobic bedrooms and claustrophobic virtual rooms. Uh, our faculty and staff is struggling to keep MIT's vast uh, virtual architecture afloat while our studios lie empty our gyms and shared spaces like the ice rink are converted into medical wards and our shops and production facilities in architecture as well as all over the institute are converted to support Boston area hospitals by making PPE and other clinical tools. Earlier today, um, I gave a presentation to MIT's leadership and heads of department about how our studio teaching is adapting to the current crisis. Students and faculty are making amazing efforts. But some of the most essential ingenuity, like our new architecture student run uh, radio station, WAWD, is a response to the biggest loss we have right now, and one that is essential to the culture of studios uh, and to the culture of our cities as well. Uh, this is not just doing what we need to do, um, but the part of studios and cities which involves doing what we didn't think we need to do, but that turns out to be essential. Um, it's this part of student life the serendipitous, the unexpected, the seemingly friv friv excuse me, <laughs> frivolous thing that turns out to be both marvelous and essential that the current moment has with so many other things taken away from us. This is why, along with thanking those uh, contributing to the logistics of this event, uh, Amanda Moore, Kevin Tierney, um, uh, uh, our current uh, head, Andrew Scott, and our, of course our speakers, I would like to thank most of all, all, all of you. Pers Precisely because you don't have to be here, but you're here anyway. You are claiming for all of us the necessity of the unexpected and the unnecessary in education and everyday life, both. To our alumni here tonight and to our visitors from other schools and institutions, I'd like particularly to welcome you, to, uh, to thank you for helping us widen this circle of serendipity and to use it to bring you either back to MIT or to visit MIT for the first time. The unexpected, an intense nature of my first two months at MIT have challenged uh, me, um, even as everyone else has been challenged all around us. But I'm particularly grateful for the ways that these last eight weeks have shown me that MIT, MIT architecture isn't us, a community far more than a set of spaces. It's a place that can exist in multiple ways and exists here tonight, thanks to you. So this is a time to embrace things like an architectural lecture that can seem normal, and that can help us reclaim our professional and intellectual identity amidst so much uncertainty. But it's not a time to pretend that things are normal. This is why I'm particularly glad to share with you that tonight's lectures, lecturers, Leslie and Sasa, former MIT students both, are donating their honorarium from tonight's lecture to a fund established by our Dean's Office for Students in Need. I would invite any of you out there with any interest in this to contact the Dean's Office with any questions about this fund or about how all our efforts can support our own and other communities in need this time. Now to the business of tonight, which is introducing our, um, our special and most welcome guests, Leslie Locke and Sasa Zivkovic. Leslie is an assistant professor and the BR coordinator at Cornell. Allied with computational technology and with a focus on urbanism, her research and teaching explore the intersection of housing, urbanization, and mass customized construction methods at multiple scales. She received her Master of Architecture at MIT in 2011 and previously taught at McGill. Sasa Zizkovic is an assistant professor also at Cornell where he directs the Robotic Construction Laboratory, an interdisciplinary research group that investigates the implementation of robotic-based construction technology. He received his MRC at MIT in 2012 when he was the recipient of the AIA Certificate of Merit. Prior to MIT, Zizkovic studied architecture and studio planning in Stuttgart where he was awarded a fellowship from the German National Academic Foundation. Sasa and Leslie's joint practice, HANA, leverages and augments ordinary technologies for material, spatial, and cultural experimentation in built projects across a whole diversity of scale. 
The, this amazing work is driven by tectonic and material explorations in architecture. It's a platform, as they say, to un unapologetically test and explore personal architectural obsessions surrounding material mis misuse, forms, construction, concrete, robots, trees, toolpaths, and buildings. The work is amazing. And I would ask us to honor it in the, honor, uh, in the absence of in-person applause and handshakes, autographs and selfies with questions, with good questions supplied by you tonight um, throughout the lecture via the webcast por portal and on Facebook. The webcast portal, the questions go right here. And if you're watching on Facebook, they're somewhere around you as well. Um, we'll be taking questions throughout the lecture. So type them in as soon as you have them and then we'll organize them and ask them at the end of the lecture. So with that, over to Leslie and Sasha, and thank you so much for joining us here tonight. All right, um, thank you, Nicholas, for this great introduction. We're gonna share our screen. Um, and we would also like to thank Andrew for the kind invitation. Uh, both Leslie and I are thrilled to lecture here at MIT from Leslie's Cornell office. And we send our greetings to the MIT community during those challenging times. As alumni, we would not be presenting our work tonight if not for the amazing pedagogical landscape that is MIT. So before we start the lecture, we would like to thank in no particular order, some of the people who deeply influenced our work and thinking. Mijin, Nader, Adele, Youngho, Sheila, Andrew, Anna, Rania, Liam, our thesis advisor, <laughs> Uh, thank you. The title of our lecture is Forms of Making. Um, we think that making is fundamental to how we operate as HANA. From the ground up, digital design and fabrication technologies are in intrinsic to the making of our work, facilitating fundamentally new material methods tectonic articulations, environmental practices, technological affordances, and forms of construction. As architectural designers, eight years out of school and we're not licensed, we consider ourselves to be biased generalists rather than specialists. The various projects presented in this lecture combine a variety of methods and material, uh, making, geometries, and social narratives. We build and embrace shared technology. We also create open source construction machines, which we argue inevitably affect how we think and design through making. In our work, we aim to mine the tension between machine means and architectural ends across scales. And we reclaim authorship over processes of construction that influence the way we can build or perhaps ought to build in the future. At various scales, our work's performance and architectural expression are inherently derived from materiality, digital construction protocols, robotic routines, and bottom-up design logics. At the same time, in the mix of means, our work is inspired by precedent, program, ecological considerations, collective labor, personal obsessions, and the misuse of technology. Based on the title of our lecture, we're also interested in the F word, and we admit that openly. When discussing the F word, Andrea Simic, our department chair at Cornell, talks about informed form. Augmented by information, form becomes a malleable concept, which implies that architecture is an interplay between aesthetic values or design and broader types of information that act upon form, that collaborate with form, or that produce synergies with form. And how does making inform architecture? How does environment, technology, program, history, and our discipline itself inform the making of architecture? The following projects are a work in progress and aim to give expression through the design to some of these questions. We spent the last five years building an infrastructure and framework for architectural explorations across scales. So starting from the design of tools, moving to the prototypes and installations, and then combining all research into the construction of a small building. About five years ago, uh, Leslie and I became interested in a new method of making, namely concrete 3D printing. And after starting a collaboration with building industry, 
we were disappointed by their limitations at the time. And so in order to conduct research in advanced manufacturing and engage new methods of making, uh, one needs the facilities, the means and tools to do such work. So on the left, you can see the 3D printer that Leslie and I built in 2011, uh, sitting on an MIT uh, studio, studio desk. desk. And on the right, you see the printer that RCL developed at Cornell in 2016 as part of an option studio. The printer is fully open source, and that is very important to us. The printer runs off an Arduino board with slightly modified firmware. Uh, a 3D model parts list and wiring diagram can be downloaded uh, on our website. We think that fully unpacking the manufacturing tool or machine is an exciting opportunity for architects to reclaim authorship over processes of construction, which fundamentally influence the way we can build. While the machine is only a framework, our thesis is with new tools come new architectural opportunities. We also believe that technology comes with a social responsibility to make these tools broadly available to all. So this printer costs about $6,000 to make. It is very much inspired by the open source movement and its realization is really only possible because of a generous open source community. And so uh, we are uh, interested in, in giving back to that community. The printer was built over a three week period in a collaborative option studio at Cornell. And here you see the final photo shoot of the printer uh, with Chris Battaglia in it, uh, who played a very big role in the design and construction of the machine. And after a period of material development and machine modification, Daedalus is now able to print full-scale building components in foam, recycled plastic, and concrete. For us, this new tool opens the door to novel architectural speculation. If there are any Cornell uh, friends visiting this lecture, this is Rand Hall before the library renovation. Our interest in the printing was in its process. Like a three-dimensional drawing, the machine horizontally deposits one line after another. And if lines are shifted through corbeling, the printer creates spatial form. Inherent in this rather simple process is the complex architectural language of concrete 3D printing. The 3D printer, a machine which has long been characterized as characterless due to having little to no constraints, is in fact exactly the opposite. It has plenty of character, maybe too much. In the project Additive Architectural Elements, our research question is, what is the architecture of 3D printed concrete? How can materiality and the unique fabrication opportunities and constraints of the tool inform the design? And before we ask the question of what the architecture 3D printed concrete, let's look into a prominent chapter of concrete architecture which inspires us. The development of reinforced concrete around 1850 has enabled unprecedented architectural expression. And through the past 150 plus years, there have been various interpretation of what constitutes an architecture of concrete. We might think of heroic cantilevers, fluidity, or a distinct articulation of board form con construction processes and exposed concrete structures. Admittedly, our concrete element from the previous slide produces certain visual linkages um, into Paul Rudolph's rough striated brutal by association, we ask ourselves, what, if anything, do we have in common with such work of architecture? And for us, the, our concrete architecture is most intriguing when there is a symbiosis between um, the material or the method of construction demands, as well as the idiosyncratic willful and biased expression um, of the architect. The merging of the two irreconcilable worlds of technical reason with expressive intuition at times produced moments of stunning architectural brilliance, beauty, and intellectual satisfaction. So in both our research and practice, we aim to bring about and introduce such balance to new processes of making. It's admittedly a work in progress. And building the machine was perhaps the easy part. Um, with the aim to derive an architecture that is intrinsic to the additive manufacturing process, 
We experimented with dozens of initial concrete mixture and printing failures to understand the material's intolerance and its inherent urge for imprecision. When printing in concrete, the same rules apply in the small desktop 3D printers, but gravity takes on an altogether different role in the process. Cantilevers have to be carefully constructed, new support material strategies have to be developed, and two paths have to be carefully manipulated. We see this manipulation of 3D printing rule sets as a tremendous opportunity. Concrete printing requires the development of an entirely new architectural language, which takes into account the limitations of the process as well as performative advantage. So in this project, it aims to review the 3D printer's own and highly idiosyncratic architectural tectonics and narratives. We chose prototypical motifs, floor, column, door, window, wall, and ceiling, and began to develop strategies as to how the layering of concrete, this relentless three-dimensional drawing of extruded lines of material, and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. So working with the constraint of gravity, this element here, the mushroom column, plays with cantilever over support material by printing upside down with horizontal striation resulting in structural assemblies that seamlessly transition between the vertical and horizontal. In the 3D printed structure, all common architectural motifs and building components must be rethought to fit the logic of layer construction. For example, a concrete printer cannot print in mid-air. Therefore, the otherwise rather simple task of creating a rectilinear window opening in the wall becomes a de facto impossibility. So rather than drastically altering the process, such as stopping the machine to insert a beam, shortcomings becomes opportunities for design. So one logical consequence for the window is to cantilever incrementally and become a triangular corbel arc. And suddenly, seemingly advanced technology relies on obsolete or archaic structural strategies such as corbeling. In the case of this element force column, the modification of printing direction, um, such as printing upside down or printing in section, is deployed to overcome printer deficiencies. Printed in section, the force column hints at the potential to deposit material where structurally necessary. And the smart push wall, similar to the force column, explores the manipulation of concrete density to optimize for structural performance and how it might begin to be architecturally expressed in a wall assembly. The potential for excessive ornamentation is brought up in the door ornament. In the full scale prototype, we were playing with delamination of layers to create screen like moments of transparency. Ornamentation can also occur horizontally in the floor ornament here. Besides patterning, the floor ornament can be structurally and algorithmically optimized. 3D printing also opens the possibility of an integration of building systems and furniture. The ceiling element is an expressive play on ducts for ventilation, reflectors for lighting, becomes a performative poche. There are multiple narratives at play in this project, and we chose to present the work with a particular speculative focus. We can also discuss the work in various other terms as well. From a technical point of view, there are multiple advantages to 3D printing. All of the elements, geometries were constructed without the use of formwork. So that constitutes a paradigm shift for concrete construction and allows for radical mass customization of buildings and building components. There's great potential for material savings because 3D printing can deposit material where structurally necessary. Also enormous advantage and path towards smarter construction. Undeniably, there is a certain formal agenda at play in this project. And bottom-up processes are highly deterministic and important when it comes to form making informed by the digital process. Yet there are important top-down decisions to be made which are harder to quantify than necessary when determining the architecture of 3D printed concrete. We then explore how we can deploy the additive architectural elements in the building context. 
The Fabrique Lilon project explores the potential of compu computational protocols, such as additive manufacturing at the architectural scale, as speculating housing um, at the urban scale. The smart pochet wall is expanded in the context of a multi-unit housing. It can be densified for structural load, thickened for party wall, and attenuated to meet the thinness of glazing transition. The core window element is explored here as both window and entrance openings at the housing scale. And the ceiling element can inform individual modules or organize into a cross modular system with mechanical connection across multiple units. Here, the force column is transformed into an integrated wall and beam system. At the cluster scale, smart pochet walls are mass customized to address different domestic functions and expanded as pochet cores for utilities or circulation. They can be organized into continuous row houses. Apart from the typological transformation, the original spine organization of linear semi-public space is transformed into a weaving network of semi-public alleys and courtyard spaces. So here, designing with the archi additive architectural elements at the housing scale can offer alternate inspirations to build our city fabric. The next project uh, we want to show is at the furniture scale informed fundamentally from the ground up by new processes of making materiality and in this case also a strange kind of program. The Rolling Stones is the winning design of the Folly Function 2018 competition sponsored by the Architectural League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park. Conceptually, the idea of a folly operates twofold. The shapes and forms of the unfamiliar sculptural seating object constitute the first folly, and the act of rolling to reveal new curvature and seating profiles constitutes the second folly. And yes, it really is difficult to roll heavy concrete chair, as difficult as it looks like in this slide. So thank you, Alex and Chris. Uh, responding to the site of the park, the 23 seats can form a long continuous bench that becomes a destination and place marker. They can also aggregate into smaller benches or disperse entirely to form different size seating groups or solitary compositions. And they provide a range of scale and seating configurations from stool to small chaise for the public. We played with the sectional profile to generate nine seating and lounging configurations in three basic prototypes, which each, with each turn revealing new curvature and seating profiles. Using the 3D printer to print in section, number four rebar is embedded between the double layer section as reinforcement. To enable the creation of cantilevered forms, the seat's interior is supported with a bed of gravel during printing. And a layer of gravel remains imprinted on each chair's interior surface, giving it a geologic character and also providing an honest reading of the fabrication process. So in this video, you can see a little bit of the testing and the design um, explorations that we did for this project, um, which started out um, as this uh, transformation of a long uh, bench object. And then um, the seats themselves can be dispersed in different ways in the park. We tested different um, printing methods, but also looked at uh, issues such as reinforcement, uh, which you will see in the, in the next video. So this is the printing process with the printer um, starting on the first layer on a sheet of plastic. And as you can see, it's a labor intensive process. Our machine is not fully automated. Uh, um, so it requires a lot of manpower to print these chairs. We did a series of reinforcement tests to uh, establish uh, what methods might be viable. Uh, this is one of the first projects that we used where, th where uh, rebar is embedded into the 3D print. So here you see how it's made. It's a double layer printed uh, with a manually inserted rebar profile that has been custom welded uh, to fit the seating profile of the chair. 
And so printing these shares uh, takes about uh, one full day. And we have since optimized the process uh, for the second iteration of this project, which is the Rolling Stones 2.0 exhibited at the Momentary, uh, which is a, a subsidiary of the Crystal Bridges Museum of uh, American Art uh, in Bentonville. So besides exploring the architectural potential of horizontal layer printing, we are also interested in developing new processes of manufacturing um, at the lab. So at RCL, based on, oops, sorry, at RCL, based on Chris Battaglia's MR thesis project, we developed a spatial method of concrete 3D printing where the concrete gets deposited on a support material, in this case, gravel. Sub-additive 3D printing is a fundamental deviation from the standard process of 3D printing, which is a horizontal deposition of tool paths, layer upon layer, and we showed that in the, in the various other projects prior. For certain complex geometries, like shells, this method has severe disadvantages. Depositing cementitious material on a supportive aggregate is not a new thing. The Philips Pavilion at the Brussels Expo 58 was one of the first modern examples to panelize a large complex surface through landforming. So casting on a shaped hyperbolic sand form, multiple panels were produced as sections of the surface, transferred to the site, and then post-tensioned to create the iconic structure. And so here's what's smart about this construction technique. The same machine that prints the concrete is used to create the flexible gravel formwork. So in the first step, the printer creates a surface that matches the curvature of the thin shell geometry, making its own formwork. So this is what you see here, um, a, a tennis ball shaping the gravel mount and then um, shaping the uh, lines for 3D printing. And then in a second step, the concrete material is deposited on the reusable gravel formwork. So this is the first panel that Chris 3D printed uh, with two layers of concrete. And so with this method, one can rapidly print highly mass customized and optimized gridded thin shell structures. So printing this with a horizontal layer um, uh, deposition method uh, is is a difficult uh, proposition. And so here you see the excavation process. Um, and some final results of Chris's thesis project. Um, this printing process has been translated to also work with the robot. Um, and it's a bit messier than we would like it to be. Uh, we have since developed uh, a new method to um, machine or post machine these pieces uh, using a CNC mill. Uh, this is something that we cannot show today, but if you're interested in knowing more about this project, uh, we wrote a paper uh, for RawBark and uh, also have more information on the website. Using the 3D printer's flexibility, we can use form finding methods and structural optimization to determine the lattice density required at each point within the surface. So depending on the shape of the structure, we get different lattice patterns, which also reduces waste material. In our research, in the lab, and in the practice, we think it is paramount to test full-scale prototypes. So this is a mock-up of sub-additive printed arches. Each component weighs roughly 150 kilograms and was printed in the span of one hour and can be rolled up for easy assembly. As a new method, Sub-additive printing leverages digital workflows to produce structurally, materially, and spatially optimized building components while dramatically reducing waste material. Contextually, sub -additive, uh, the uh, sub-additive project expands on a lineage of thin shell structures by the likes of Nervi, Candela, Isler, or Dieste. So we are currently working on improved printing accuracy, the integration of fiber reinforcement and novel cement mixtures that don't have a massive environmental impact. And the latter point I think is very important because we cannot sustain concrete as a building material by saving material alone. 
So the concrete has to fundamentally be rethought in the context of 3D printing to become a viable building material for the future. So here back to the tools, because a concrete printer can only get you that far. Compared to other institutions, the RCL lab has very limited resources. So we have to be inventive when it comes to equipment. As it turns out, one can go to eBay and purchase a used KUKA KR200 for $8,000. And this is how it arrives. The robot was formerly a welding robot for GM, producing cars in the plant in Louisiana. While the machine is proprietary, it was important for us to keep the rest of the project open source. In terms of cost, it is hard, it is hard to find a cheaper robot. A certain amount of hacking is required to make this robot work for architectural production. All information on how to set this up is available on the RCL website and in an Acadia paper written by the lab called Open Source Factory. For us, this robot has enabled research beyond the three axis constraints of the 3D printer and is a new technological means to inform form and new material. So Lognot is a project that emerged from our first initial exploration with custom wood-based tools for the robot that Leslie just showed. And wood is an interesting material because it surrounds us in so many ways. As a building material, we encounter wood in the shape of two by fours or plywood or other standardized dimensions. But as this image shows, wood comes from trees that are usually non-standard. Lognot is a robotically fabricated architectural installation which aims to expand and optimize the use of entire trees and irregular timber geometries in construction. The research team, which included Brian Haberner, a research associate uh, who did this project um, in, in his MARC studio and then continued to work on it uh, as a research associate in the lab. Um, the team examined whether regular uh, and in irregular round wood geometries can be processed to construct compound curvature assemblies. The project creates an infinite loop of round wood curving three dimensionally along its length. And the project borrows strategies from traditional wood building and manufacturing while implementing contemporary technologies to achieve precision and mass customization. Components are computationally processed to form a spatially complex figure eight knot this is a series of diagrams and studies um, and a, a conceptual model uh, on the site. In a reciprocal design process, the project fosters synergies and feedback between material fabrication, digital form, and full-scale construction. New technological paradigms such as robotic-based fabrication radically challenge our understanding of wood as a building material but have yet to take better advantage of wood as a sustainable and smart material for construction. Small round wood members or tree forks are usually not utilized for construction purposes because today's sawmills are not equipped to process those irregular tree geometries. So this project uses computation to optimize each joint for tension forces and each of the joints is precisely rotated to resist forces and local buckling. Here you see a detail of the various mortise and tenon joints that we tested for the project. Each joint is secured by three lag bolts and log knot is designed for this assembly, therefore relying upon the use of steel lag bolts instead of wooden dowels. The fabrication was done on our KUKA platform using a custom CNC mill and effector. The mill first creates a planar surface on the log and then creates the mortise and tenon rough cut. We then use the side of the end mill to smoothen the rough cut, uh, which saves a lot of time and is an efficient way of utilizing the tool that we have at hand and the end effector. And to prevent checking and shaking, the milled end grains were covered in pentacryl, which is a non-toxic wood stabilizer and um, so this prevented um, checking and allowed us uh, to assemble these pieces uh, more or less accurately. 
As we work with small budgets, we did not have access to heavy machinery and therefore developed a self-sufficient construction method that requires only minimal formwork or support. So the idea was, can we design a joint that is so smart that uh, it guides the shape and form uh, of the wood assembly? So each component was lifted in place by hand. And uh, while we think concrete is heavy, wood is also surprisingly heavy in these dimensions. Uh, so this is a considerable effort. And then in a second step, we fastened the wood in place using the geometry of the joint to guide the form of the arc. So here you see an, uh, a video of the assembly process. And so to hold up the structure during construction, all that is required is a minimal support of attached two by fours. So you see them emerging at the top of the frame the two two by fours um, nailed to the wood structure to give some additional support. Unfamiliar notions of craftsmanship and precision, both digital and analog, emerged from Lognot's conceptual design practice and characteristic construction technique. Lognot was exhibited as part of Cornell's 2018 biennial called Duration, Passage, Persistence, Survival and addresses this theme on multiple levels. Environmental cycles, birth, growth, and decay are intrinsic to complex uh, forest ecosystems and processes. Conceptually and spatially, the Lognot project references these e eternal cycles and the reciprocal relationships between systems, both natural and technical. The infinite looping structure is an interplay between archaic natural geometry advanced computation, and state-of-the-art digital fabrication. By questioning how forests are used as a resource, Lognot provides a critical commentary on various perpetual wood cycles, economic, environmental, and cultural in nature. From the ground up, new material means and construction methods are intrinsic to the making of this last project. The Ashen Cabin recalibrates expectations around digital fabrication methods and out of contextual necessity, explores the architectural opportunities of digital analog construction hybrids from the ground up to the scale of a building. And informed by multiple forces, the building follows two strands of material narratives. It is 3D printed from concrete and clothed in a robotically fabricated envelope constructed from irregular woodlocks. The making of the building is also informed by a key environmental crisis of the ash trees in North America. Since its discovery in the US in 2002, the emerald ash borer killed tens of millions of ash trees, drastically transforming the entire forest ecosystems in the process. The EAB threatens to eradicate nearly all of the 8.7 billion ash trees in North America. And as of October 2018, it is found in 35 states and several Canadian provinces. As a reference, 10% of all trees in New York state are ash trees. So that is almost one in 10 trees you see will die or are dying. And this is a huge problem and our means of construction might contribute to some form of gruesome after the effect remedy. And the first material narrative, the 3D printed concrete structure is characterized by three programmatic areas, a table, a storage seat element, and a 6.5 meter tall working fireplace. It has a footprint of three by three meters and lifts off the ground on printed legs which adjusts to the slope terrain. The legs are printed in components and function as sacrificial zero waste formwork for the main structural system to eliminate substantial construction waste. It used a cast in place concrete structure with custom rebar. This slide here shows the interior of the printed concrete leg with inserted rebar cage. And the drone photo here showing the nested modules on site they're also nested so that they can be transported um, fairly easily on a truck. And here's a top view of the cast in place structure with the rebar cages. 
Each leg is then filled with foam in the void of the legs and concrete are poured in between to form the structure. And going up, and here's the assembly of the chimney. We have turned into little contractors with our scaffolding. Um, the cabin here, as you can see, is expressive and corbeling becomes a generative motif. There is a tectonic expression that is generated by the fabrication method and materiality. You can see the underside of the cabin showing the corbel legs connecting to the terrain on nine points actually one of which does not touch the ground. In deliberately designing a cabin and not a pavilion or installation, we have to address border architectural considerations such as how does the building touch the ground? How do we 3D print a fireplace? Similar to the window element, corbeling is used to produce the opening of a working fireplace. And here the articulation of the horizontal striation is used as a tectonic strategy to produce seamless vertical transition from the lake to a four inch concrete slab and finally to the chimney above. The G code and printed path are exploited in the ornamental pattern of the 3D printed floor slabs. The slabs are also organized in a nine square grid reflecting the interlocking pattern of the legs beneath. And finally, here's the envelope that is slides from trees to question preconceived notions about material standards and wood. In 2018, the EAB arrived at Cornell. In order to use such trees in construction, we develop a new process to build the wood envelope. Available ash trees are harvested from the Cornell Arno forest. And by implementing high precision 3D scanning and robotic based fabrication technology, as you can see here, irregularly shaped waste wood are transformed into abundantly available, affordable, and morbidly sustainable building material for the Anthropocene. Utilizing the KUKA KR200 robot with a custom five horsepower bandsaw end effector. We can robotically slice irregular tree logs into naturally curved boards and strategically assemble the boards to form a variety of surface conditions. The boards follow the geometry of the naturally bent logs and they can be sliced into various and also varying thicknesses up to two millimeter thin. Also by adjusting the thickness of the cut, the robotically carved timber boards can be assembled as complex single curvature surfaces or double curvature surfaces. Here you see this drawings, it shows the number of logs that was harvested from 10 trees at the forest. And a quick uh, GIF showing how one of the logs can be sliced according uh, to the fork geometry. Geometric form finding and assembly protocols from form to log and log to form have been developed for this project. We started with an initial massing design and then according to the log that we have sourced, the log curvature serve as a feedback into the finalized design form. So there's a reciprocity between the top-down design and also the available um, uh, raw resources. And this is the West Elevation drawing. Architecturally, the natural bent wood planks create the enclosure. And the curvature of the wood is strategically deployed to highlight moments of architectural importance, as you can see in this diagram. And so no longer bound to the paradigm of industrial standardization, such as a wooden two by four, this project revisits bygone woodcraft and design based on organic found and living materials. How can irregular timber geometries be used to create fully functioning, ventilated, waterproof, and insulated high performance building envelope? How does the envelope turn corners? What are the detailed connections between wood and concrete? 
how are windows integrated into the wall system? And how can the natural curvature of the log inform an awning, an entrance, a door handle, or highlight a corner opening for an extremely articulated drain spout, or frame views? Technically, the envelope functions similar to the logic of a SIP panel. The panels are insulated using a two-component closed cell foam, which is fully biodegradable. The facade assembly is fully ventilated and is detailed to manage shrinkage and transformation of wooden boards to offset the air drying process and does not require an additional rain screen. And here is a view of the interior of the cabin. Um, this shows the, 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 the ceiling and the roof structure of the cabin using combining with um, typical uh, two by six rafter. The cabin combined a variety of fabrication methods, material applications, geometries, and types of construction. So at various scale, the cabin's performance, structure, and architectural expression is inherently derived from its digital construction protocols, robotic routines, materiality, and design logics. And together, the various and sometimes conflicting means, robotic or otherwise, inherently inform the form and the architectural expression of this project. It is important to emphasize that this occurs at the scale of a building from ground up using newly invented forms of making. Thank you. And uh, we also want to thank our team uh, because while it's the two of us presenting, this mm -hmm. work would not be possible without a, a very big team of highly dedicated uh, students, former students, research associates, and research assistants. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, those are also your projects. Thank you. Thank you. So we finished a, a bit early, uh, mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, we thought, uh, you know, uh, as this is a, a digital format uh, lecture, we, we don't, we don't want to go over. And so this might give us a bit more time for questions or um, an earlier end to our evenings. <laughs> oh, well, well, thank you, Guy. I, I just want to thank you all so much. As I said um, in my introduction, you know, these are not normal times, nor times to uh, pretend are normal, but the, uh, uh, the, the kind of inventiveness and imagination of the work um, allows us to um, think about all kinds of possibilities, including for new kinds of work and new kinds of being, even um, amidst all, all sorts of uncertainties. So I, I really want to express uh, gratitude on behalf of uh, myself, of the community of the school, and of the um, over 700 viewers uh, we've had with us uh, uh, this evening um, for the for the lecture, which is uh, just an astonishing um, testament to you and a testament to this larger community as well. Um, I, I wanted to start. Um, uh, I think we've all learned about the differential staminas of, of online and, and in person events over the last few weeks, but we'll we'll push this a little bit further because we've also got lots of questions from the audience. And um, uh, uh, and I guess before we even go to those. I wanted to ask you to go back to the to the to the F word <laughs> to the very <laughs> beginning of your lecture, um, uh, and some 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 uh, uh, thoughts about uh, form and and form related to two ideas that that we're all grappling with at the moment, which is certainty and uncertainty. Um, uh, we had a moment in the very first flush of, uh, of of parametric digital architecture in the in the last few decades of a kind of profusion of form, a form about which lots of things were, were all too certain um, and deterministically uh, made. And I guess one, one thing I very much appreciated about the work, but I wanted to prompt you to talk about a little bit more, is um, uh, a kind of an, an abundance of form, but an abundance of form that, that juxtaposed the ability of digital shapes to expand, overlap, multiply, and, and create a great deal of complexity, complexity that harkens back to the 
low cost of labor of things like the King's College Chapel, but then um, a, a different kind of complexity um, that makes me think of the, you know, the origins of the land art mu movement at Cornell that your Lognot project is obviously a tribute to as well. And, and the idea of entropy, um, uh, you know, Gordon Matta Clark and, and Robert Smithson met on the Cornell campus and the, um, uh, and, and the kind of profusion of form that comes from the operation of entropy is often seen as a kind of contrast between the deterministic nature of digital form. Um, um, but, but in your work, the, the two are very much in collaboration. So I wanted you to, part of what makes the concrete work beautiful is the, is the mistakes or, or the uncertainties around the precision in the, that, that sort of surround the precision in the process. And the same is obviously true in the, in the uh, beautiful cutting of logs. Uh, and the, the entropy of, of living forms and knots and, and, and all the rest. So th that question of form and certainty and uncertainty seems to be to run very deep in the work. And I, I wondered if you could reflect a little bit more explicitly on it while I have a moment to get together everybody else's questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think, um, you know, for, for a while, it was difficult uh, to talk about form in our discipline because mm -hmm. it, it might have been sort of uh, uh, misused um, uh, within a certain kind of moment of time. But I think that was also that was necessary uh, for that particular uh, discourse project. I think what differentiates here our work is this connection to materiality, um, and uh, this is by no means a a kind of solitary invention of ours. So there are many uh, fellow colleagues and, and offices that are that are deeply invested in in materiality and form and digital form and uh, perhaps in architectural expression. Um, so I think the the certainty or uncertainty uh, in in these projects comes through the material, which brings its own challenges uh, and which sometimes work in your favor and sometimes don't which sometimes produce happy accidents and sometimes don't. And uh, so that, that gives it something concrete uh, to push back, uh, I think. And so the materiality is a, is a really important uh, determining factor in the work. What I want to point out is that um, for us, it's important, uh, especially in the last project, that we apply these uh, methods of material form making to the scale of a building, because that expands the discourse and brings other issues uh, to, to this kind of research, which usually has a tendency to focus on prototypes or to focus on installations uh, or to focus on sort of smaller scale investigations and has yet to arrive in many cases at, at the building, which comes with its own constraints and issues that kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, contaminate uh, the, the, the diagram. Mm -hmm. And I think also in, to address that, um, there are um, more than just, uh, let's say, our willful desire for a particular formal uh, expression um, that we have to engage with. So direction, I mean, as simple as, again, direction of roof, how do we produce an interesting architectural strategy that connects with the ground? Um, so I think a lot of these other, con um, uh, let's say, challenges, construction challenges, also inform the, the form. Um, so um, the process of making, so there's the material, but there's also then what we can make and what we can test and what we can generate that uh, allows us to play with the form. That's great. I'm, I'm now going to move to uh, questions from the audience and I'm going to uh, synthesize and put a couple of questions together in, uh, in the next two questions. Um, there are some really interesting questions, one from um, uh, uh, Pamela Tang, who's the head of our alumni association, who I'm delighted to, to see here. And then um, another question um, from another audience member about traditional architectural techniques as they relate to this process. So. Um, uh, there's a question about study models and the, and the role of modeling, both digitally and otherwise in the process. And then there's another really interesting question about drawing when you're moving so kind of promiscuously between plan and section and thinking about how these things are made. Does it relate to how you think about objects and environments and plan and section as you also deploy more traditional media? So drawings and models in, in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, I think models is it be, 
it, 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 our model testing has uh, a big range of scale. So we have, you know, the traditional, uh, your hand size, let's say, massing models that you play with. But I think oftentimes we engage much more with like prototyping scale. So looking at half scale, um, for example, in the in the um, in the cabin project, um, when we want to test out. Uh, the, the the sort of log design and geometry um, to really figure out the, the building system or the layering we actually have to we produce a half scale corner uh, prototype um, so I think model making it becomes a really really integral part of the design um, and 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 then playing with both at kind of the design uh, um, study model scale and also actually at the material scale is really important. Um, it allows us to test out, oh, the wood is cracked or, oh, well, wow, this is really, really heavy when we thought it would be lighter when you're playing with smaller tweaks and logs. And then once you switch to a big log and you realize how heavy it can be. Yeah. Um, regarding drawings and representations, uh, what we found interesting about the printing process is that it, it is very similar to, to drawing because it's mm -hmm. the deposition of, of line upon line to build a three-dimensional form. So in a, in a funny way, these are sort of uh, sketches, um, the prints that we do. Um, this is all very much work in progress. I think you can see the sort of roughness of some of these experimentations for better or worse. Um, and so uh, I think drawing sort of through model is, is something that uh, we are interested in, in these explorations. Regarding the, the question of um, uh, traditional building precedents, um, I think, you know, this is something that we tangentially mention in the, in the presentation and uh, would probably need uh, a bit more, more backup. Um, and, and sort of thoroughness uh, to be developed into, into a stronger argument. Uh, but, but we do think that, for example, the use of round woods in construction or the use of irregular members, we could, we could have shown um, sort of the, the German uh, Fachwerkhaus uh, series. Uh, so there, there is, a, there is a, a, a legacy architecturally, but maybe also in some of the uh, Design disciplines or engineering, such as shipbuilding and, and so on, that that this uh, that these projects reference, and uh, certainly we have looked at that without now explicitly pointing it out in the, in the lecture. Um, so so these references are are floating around in the work, uh, I would say. Mm. And also maybe referring back to the one of the questions about drawing, um, you were talking about modes of representation um, and how that plays in, let's say, the process of the making um, of some of these projects. And um, I think because of what uh, you know, the digital tool allows us to do sometimes in certain cases, and a lot of the time due to time constraint to bypass um, technical drawings. Um, so uh, you know, in the case of the cabin, um, from the design to the building, um, there is some level of, let's say, drawing in terms of plans and sections, but in terms of making and building the building, since we are, we are designing it, but we're also building it ourselves, we, there is that one level that is kind of taken out normally when you have an architect, a designer, and you give it to a contractor and the drawing needs to communicate in, in that stage than to you know construct something um, so in, in the cabin in that case during the construction process the drawing was more of a exploration tool rather than um, a means of communicating how to build it so you know in the prototypes or even in the concrete part a lot of the time it was we go from the 3d model then to the print paths and then to the actual 3D printing and construction of the physical um, object. So the drawing part in some cases are bypassed. And then the question goes back to after we build the building, how do we share it? How do we represent it with the community? And so then there's a return back to, you know, drawing it using conventional um, uh, drawing standards. Um, in the case of the Rolling Stone, um, we also went back, actually started a, a machine drawing project that we then share here, 
because we start to question, you know, how do you represent a 3D printed object? Um, and using the conventional plans and section doesn't fully, uh, let's say, translate or express the design logic of this 3D printed project in that mm -hmm. case. Well, just just a quick follow up to that. Um, mm -hmm. One of one of the so we struggle with this question of drawing, I would say. Uh, so Leslie outlined some of the struggles going from digital to prototype. So in, in some ways, uh, we, we, as I've said, we conceptualize uh, drawing through the model. But uh, what is, is missing and we think is uh, a kind of missed opportunity uh, is using drawing as a generative tool. And uh, mm -hmm. its role as a generative tool is kind of submerged in here. So that's why we think the model is a generative tool in our case. Uh, but we are exploring ways currently in, in these projects to think about drawing as a generative tool, to you think about the machine and, and the drawing in mm -hmm. combination uh, as a generative tool. And um, so th these are some of our, our next research steps. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a quick follow-up question that's, that's also come up, but does you know, the idea of drawing relate to how you're actually spending your time now when, when so much of us don't have access to the tools and shops and large equipment that we, that we think and work with? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so currently we are uh, working in the office on, on scaling up uh, some of these projects. Uh, so we're, uh, we would like to 3D print um, a residential project um, and um, a sort of housing project uh, following thereafter. And so th this requires a certain uh, set of I guess, conventional design methods. Mm -hmm. uh, I think by now we have developed an understanding of some of these material processes and behaviors that we can take them into account while drawing and designing. Uh, so that's kind of a, maybe an intuitive uh, layer that has emerged mm -hmm. uh, within the practice um, that substitutes for some of the model making. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it is unfortunate that we, that we cannot uh, access our, our shop right now, like so, like so many others. Uh, the robots are sitting and waiting. Taking a break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're sleeping, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, so, so go back to the robots, there's a lot of people in the questions interested in the actual physics of production and materiality and everything from can you can you print rebar to to some technical questions around uh, how uh, whether you're experimenting with or collaborating with others at Cornell on more sustainable or different concrete mixes? How how much of the practice at, at this point is involved in that materiality and experimentation about materiality, and how much of it is related to the questions of process and form that we were also talking about? Um, well, in 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 the in the RCL, um, Sasha is actually currently collaborating with um, uh, researchers at Cornell in engineering and design and looking at using different natural fiber as reinforcement. Um, it is um, we we one has to address that you know ultimately cement or sand it's it's a limited resources and we have to rethink you know, the composition or the mixture of such. And, and this is what's so great about interdisciplinary um, collaboration. That's not something that, let's say, architectural designer alone can address. So um, there's definitely that strand that um, we are pursuing and, and looking at uh, how we can think at the material scale. Um, and um, in terms of than the, the sort of technicalities of material printing rebars. Um, one thing is uh, maybe we have slightly mentioned it in the lecture that the in, in the making of the Rolling Stones is actually quite labor intensive because um, we have to gravel the pieces while we print and it's not a fully automated uh, process. And I think that comes um, down to our priority of what we're interested in exploring um, and the way the printer was constructed as a you know, as a method and as a tool to explore what we're interested in exploring architecturally. Um, so it wasn't our initial intention to um, design like a full streamlined automated system. So we, we were interested in developing and hacking to an extent that allow us to do what we like to do. Um, so 
so therefore, you know, in terms of, let's say, different material, um, uh, printing multiple material at the same time, we definitely, you know, see that possibilities and there are ongoing, plenty of ongoing research that does that, you know, there already are um, research at other institute that looks at uh, uh, robotically weld welding rebar and so on. So those technology exist, um, they, but however, they, they don't play yet and occupy this sort of larger uh, space in our work currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, to, to follow up on that, I think there there may be two components um, to this question. So one is, um, besides collaborations in academia, um, we're interested in collaborations with building industry. Mm -hmm. And I think to scale up some of these processes of making, uh, one has to engage building industry at a, at a fundamental level. And this transformation will take time. Um, building industry is, uh, is changing. It's one of the last uh, sort of uh, non-automated industries. And so for, for better or worse, I think um, this will come uh, as, a, as a process in the future. So automation will uh, arrive in construction. And I think uh, it's important that we as architects have agency in it. Mm -hmm. uh, by becoming experts in some of these tools and technology. How, uh, there's a lot of questions on how things scale up. And uh, mm. uh, obviously we're not just gonna get a, uh, an enormous robot to attack a redwood tree. So how, how, do, you, how do you scale up the, 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 the means and scale of the work while keeping mm. the precision of the knowledge and understanding that you developed at the scales that you have? I think the, the way that we've done it or have been doing it is to recognize what um, what are the positive, what are the pros and cons of, let's say, a particular tool and material system. So um, and 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 leveraging what is good about it and what is what it can do, and not try to force it to do everything. Um, so meaning that, let's say, in the cabin, the envelope is uh, robotically uh, fabricated. Um, but the roof structure in the end that we used was a rather simple, you know, roof joist sort of construction with uh, uh, rafters and so on and so forth. So um, we definitely could, you know, apply also the same robotically slicing for the roof. But I think recognizing, well, due to time constraint as well, um, what uh, when we should deploy the robot and when we can customize and then when can we also take advantage of traditional and conventional building techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about reinventing the wheel, um, but um, finding smart and smarter way to uh, customize and in this case mass customize um, using our tools and material at the larger scale. And I think to scale up, um, we have to understand and acknowledge the, the, the shortcoming and advantages of specific tools and material and, and use it to their advantage. Yeah, and we can't, we can't disclose any details, but there are, uh, there are big printers that can actually print houses. <laughs> so these, uh, these developments have uh, uh, kind of uh, happened in the past couple of years. So when we started the, the printer uh, development in 2016, um, this technology was only available in a very limited way. Um, and so uh, in the last four years, things have changed drastically, I would say. And so scaling up becomes more and more feasible and possible. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully the next time we meet, we can share some of that. Wonderful. Um, I'm gonna synthesize, I think we have time for about two more questions, but for the first one, I'm gonna synthesize two questions on the theme of improvisation on both how, uh, 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 it, how much the, there's a, what one question describes as a beautiful kind of uncanny and improvisational posture to the, to the cabin and how the, the, the way it perches on the ground. But this also relates to a larger question of how of, of what is the, the of a lot of questions on the precision of the, of the life cycle of data in a process of, of scanning and making things, uh, you know, making slices of wood that don't turn out quite how you expect them to, I'm sure, and then probably also need to be scanned. And then where is design in that process and where is improvisation and what's the, what's the difference between the two, between the precision and imprecision of, of, a, of a process that I'm, I'm guessing resembles jazz more than um, you know, than Bach, but maybe you can um, uh, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, well, I think the um, 
the the cabin uh, is a is a good example um, because essentially uh, what 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 it is is a feedback between uh, an intended design and and the material uh, on the other hand. So you go into the forest, you say, okay, roughly I need ten logs. Roughly I want to do this with the wood, and uh, then you go and cut down ten trees, and you you find things that are similar to what you had in mind, but uh, in the end uh, you don't get exactly what you were shopping for, as opposed to when you go to Home Depot and buy mm -hmm. a two by four, you know that if you select a straight one, it's going to be uh, a two by four. And so there's a feedback between the material. So we literally go out into the forest and look at the stuff and uh, have to then redesign based on the things that we find. So that's a kind of improvisation that happens by design in the cabin because the material sort of uh, forces that uh, mm -hmm. upon the design process. And it's, so this is, this is a challenge. It's not easy to think that way and to design a project that way because there's this uncertainty about the material. So until the very last minute, we don't really know what this, the cabin will look like uh, due to some of these factors. I mean, there is the, the maybe the top down, uh, let's say intuition or like for, you know, designers and architects and, um, and, and, and then we, take full advantage of that. Um, and so also recognizing there are um, design opportunities that comes from curvature. Like, of course we would leverage that and maybe exaggerate certain moments, especially, you know, an example of the drain spout. Um, and so, so there, there are these sort of top-down desire, uh, expressive desire that we want to achieve. And, um, and then like Sasha said, there is the there is the feedback between the, the material character. So it's not entirely, um, uh, you know, like totally open and total improvisation. Um, so there is a level of calibration within the process. Um, we also intentionally, a lot of the time when it comes to form, um, uh, avoid full optimization um, and not allowing let's say optimization really play out the design fully mm -hmm. and um, and that's also due to our our partial bias towards you know having these uh, design mm -hmm. uh, expression that we want to play with I mean some some of this also has to do with with the particular structure that we work with so there's the lab and then there's the office and so the, so mm -hmm. the lab uh, does fundamental research it looks at concrete and mixtures and collaborates with researchers and, and tries to advance uh, the sort of more engineering based architectural discourse. But in the practice, uh, we have the freedom to bring in other narratives and to, uh, I guess, sort of contaminate the ideal optimized engineered state mm -hmm. of things. And this is what the cabin really is because uh, um, it, there, there's no way to sort of uh, optimize this um, or there's no way to justify it through optimization so there are other narratives architectural design narratives at play that are important here and so this is a project that demonstrates that that these two kind of realms mm -hmm. can be combined and connected so that that provides a good follow-up um uh I'm, I'm still going to allow myself a, <laughs> those questions keep cropping up so this, this will be the second to last question um uh but I, I'm going to synthesize a couple of questions with the, you know, the observation that one of one of Marshall McLuhan's laws of media is that the the future resembles not the present but the past that preceded the present. And so, you know, in in your rejection of optimization, which was of course often part of the language of modern of modern architecture, if not always part of the actual substance of modern architecture, um, there's uh, and in a lot of the questions, um, there's a uh, th there is a uh, there's questions, for example, here about um, questions of locality. Like, does does the idea of looking out your window at your materials relate to this idea of localness of architecture? That 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 um, uh, outside of modern of, of what we've come to expect to be glo uh, globe spanning supply chains, or does it also it also relates to a question about um, ornamentation and decoration, which um, uh, often served a functional purpose historically, but has a uh, also has a, a different kind of character in the work that you've shown. So, so maybe if you, if you could reflect a little bit on this idea of the, the of the past that preceded the present, as well as the future, and and how these questions of optimization, ornamentation, locality are are, are potentially challenged by some of the um, uh, 
the, the fundamental questions that your work raises. <laughs> you see, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe the question is not clear. But yeah. I, this is a this is a this is a good yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the locality uh, plays a big role, let's say, in the uh, in both the log now and the cabin. And um, one thing is that I don't think we will we would have produced the work that show that we show today if we were not in Ithaca, um, mm. in, in Cornell, um, and what this context provide us. And so um, maybe the, the row of the wood, the row of the, 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 the situation with the ash tree, um, I would say in the beginning, it wasn't something that we see as like, oh, we need to work with some local material, but it, it presents itself as an opportunity for us to think about, oh, well, now there is this uh, infestation with the ash trees, what can we do with it? And it happened to be, you know, a big problem in New York State. So this actually prompted us to think about now, how can we use these trees locally? Um, and if this is a resource that is all over North America, um, how can we, and, and in such a non-standardized way, then how can we develop um, you know, building strategies that we can actually uh, upcycle these wood, um, these logs. And, and so then, you know, the, the sort of locality begin to play a much stronger role once we have, um, was present, once we were presented with this uh, opportunity here. Um, and also with the 3D printing as well, you know, one of the biggest advantages, you could 3D print on site and on site 3D printing has been happening now also at the building scale. Um, not in our work, but uh, you know, as Sasha mentioned, um, the challenge, let's say, for our printer was that you know our site was extremely uneven, and 3D printing requires you know uh, a fairly stable flat ground to condition to print. So, um, so the locality, uh, you know, topic can come into the local resources. How do you reuse local resources, and also how you can print on site? Actually, the, the production of building on site as kind of a local. Um, uh, uh, focus and that way that also you know eliminates a lot of the transportations and so on and so forth so um, so that is there's definitely that narrative and embedment in, 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 in these uh, process. Mm -hmm. the, the question of uh, past, future, present uh, histories uh, in, in the work um, I think is, is an interesting one and it's a it's a challenging one to to answer, I would say, and I, I don't think that there is a definitive answer. I think what we've come to enjoy through working much more in the practice is is the freedom to leave things up for interpretation, also, um, which I think um, is is something that we do with the with the cabin, uh, because in the in the practice we're not bound to some of the constraints of of the lab, and and so um, I think. I think depending on who looks at this, it might have a different different answer to your question. And that's also a good thing, I would say. Um, so that's not really a, a shortcoming generally within within a within a discourse-based uh, discipline. Well, that's uh, maybe a good prompt for the, the last question that's come up. I mean, I, I would reflect on the, um, we, we're very sorry not to be in the physical space at MIT, but one of the things that this, current improvisation gives us is the ability to, to welcome, as we have tonight, both our current students and a large segment of our alumni into a, a shared space, as, as, as limited as this can be described as a space. And so it's a, it's a nice moment to ask a question that, that several uh, people in the audience have asked too. Um, maybe just answer very briefly, wh what about your work is MIT? Or what about uh, your work have you taken from MIT into these other places and ecologies um, uh, uh, distinctively as you packed your bag for your journey from here um, into, into your career? Wow, that so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I think there's the, the culture of hacking, the DIY, make your machine, mm -hmm. figure it out, try it out, test something, make something. Um, that is, I think, uh, fundamental to, to MIT and its culture. But then in the department, I think there's a, there's a very rigorous commitment to 
uh, discourse and to creating an argument for a project and honing in on it and refining mm -hmm. it. And uh, this is at least what we attempt to do, not successfully, I think, in, in all cases, um, but that's the ambition. And so th this is uh, sort of uh, what we carry as a, as a package from, from MIT. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, that's a that's a beautiful moment to end on. So I, I would say that um, uh, to all of you watching, um, uh, who we can't see and who we are very sad not to be physically present with, I would, um, I would, I would uh, apologize deeply for our own improvisations tonight. This is the first time any of us have done this. I'm I'm uh, um, standing in a house with a computer on top of a set of cardboard boxes that are thankfully <laughs> out, outside of the frame, and and we're all. Um, making this up as we go along, um, maybe uh, hearkening back to the to the beautiful improvisation, hopefully in 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 the work that we've seen tonight. Um, uh, and so, uh, with that um, uh, apology, also comes again the enormous gratitude for uh, joining us together um, for, for something whose unnecessary qualities are are deeply necessary um, uh, in this time. So, thank you for bringing the the serendipity uh, and grace of your work to help us create a little bit of serendipity and grace here tonight uh, on behalf of uh, myself, but mostly of, of, of everyone else watching who doesn't have the ability to speak. So thanks guys. I'm gonna give you, Thank you. a hand. <laughs>